Hi, thanks for coming to my talk. My name is Matt Smith. I'm a postdoc from the University of Oxford. And today I'm going to talk to you about some research that we did recently where we tried to understand how pilots might react when faced with realistic attacks on their systems. So who are we? Well, we're a team of researchers from the University of Oxford and Armour Swiss. Armour Swiss is the research and development part of the Swiss Ministry of Defence. And we've been involved in security research now for about eight years, covering topics such as ADSB and ACARS, uh, more recently broadening in some other areas as well. We've also been involved in founding OpenSky, which is a, a really great project. I really recommend you check it out, especially if you're involved in aviation. Uh, it is a research-focused ADSB MODES uh, collection network, so really would recommend checking that out. So the past 10 years has really seen a rise in um, research from a, a wide range of groups all around the world, publishing at top-tier conferences, in um, much more practical security venues like uh, Black Hat and DEF CON, master's theses, all sorts of different bits of research. And often these, um, these papers have proposed really interesting attacks that um, really you know, propose something new and um, focus on the part between the transmission of the signal and getting this onto the aircraft. And obviously you can kind of predict some effects that this might have on how the aircraft is flown. But it really does raise the question of how well do pilots handle these kind of attacks? So we think this is a really interesting question because pilots are often assessed on how they handle faults and they usually do this in a flight simulator and this is a full motion one on the right hand side here and they're sort of a last line of defense against these faults because they have this really well-defined procedure it's part of their training and you know it's a really key part of their job and we started to think about how this fault, fault handling skill might translate to mitigating attacks and also whether you can use flight simulation to actually understand the impact of attacks like you can use it to understand the impact of faults. So something we really want to focus on um, at this point and just highlight is the fact that this piece of work is actually interested in the effects of attacks rather than say the technical detail of the attacks themselves. So as we all know, normally the kind of chain uh, of um, signal to action is there's some sort of legitimate signal from air traffic control or whatever it might be, it gets to the aircraft and it's presented to, present to the pilots somehow, the pilots um, you know, act on that and then there's some sort of behavior that comes out of it and that's normal. Uh, as we know, many of these aviation communications are unencrypted. so. You know, we have this part that I've just talked about where there's been a lot of research, this creation of signals that are transmitted to the aircraft. But what we're interested in this piece of work is what happens when those signals arrive at the aircraft and are presented to the pilots? How do they perceive them? What do they do with them? Does it affect how the aircraft is flown? So to do this, we invited 30 tight rated Airbus A320 pilots to come and fly in our um, little simulator that we built in, in our uh, building. And within that simulator we implemented some attacks on collision avoidance systems ground proximity warning systems and landing systems and we're only going to cover two of those today just to um, keep it focused but um, I, we, we do have some more info if people are interested in the other one we used x-plane 11 which is a high quality aircraft model uh, and we had a single pilot set up so the experiment provided some basic flying support in terms of pushing buttons and enabling modes but nothing more than that they didn't actually contribute to decisions made. In terms of how we actually carried this out, we had a familiarization flight first, so the pilots could get used to the route and the controls. And then we had a simulator flight for each of the attacks that implemented the attack. And after they'd flown it, the pilots debriefed with us to tell us a little bit about what they observed and uh, what they thought had gone on. We had quite a spread of experience actually, all the way from fairly newly qualified pilots through to people who'd spent their, pretty much their entire professional career flying. And so before we carry on, we need to think about what our attacker looks like, what might they want to achieve? And obviously the first thing you think about in this situation is, do they want to cause a crash? And in our uh, in our kind of experiment, we weren't that interested in that because 
we had a simulator with some limits. We only had a single pilot in and the situations in which an attacker would need um, to be involved in order to cause this kind of kinetic effect would be very extreme right at the edge of the pilot's capabilities. And that wouldn't be a fair uh, situation to put the pilots in, but it also wouldn't really allow us to actually assess anything because they do have some limits in how they interface with the simulator. So instead, we're looking at softer effects, but ones that really do have an impact. So things like triggering go-arounds where the aircraft can't land and so they have to go and take a, um, a, another uh, go at the landing. Forcing unexpected maneuvers, this could be any sort of maneuver really outside of the intended profile of the aircraft. Or it could also be to push crew to switch the systems off that they rely on, which is particularly bad when some of these systems are really quite um, tightly related to safety. And all of these can have a range of sort of second order effects, if you will, things like causing delay or costing money. And obviously the worst of these is actually reducing safety, if that's what happens. The equipment needed for these attacks is fairly typical for this kind of, uh, this kind of experiment or this kind of uh, attack, if you will. And basically here we're looking at a scientific grade software defined radio, a high gain amplifier and a directional antenna. Obviously this will vary a little bit depending on the type of attack and exactly where the attacker is positioned, but fairly standard for this kind of research. So the first system that I'm going to talk about is TCAS. There'll be other talks that go into much more detail on TCAS. Um, so I'm not really going to get into the technical uh, detail and specifics, but uh, really what TCAS is trying to do is stop aircraft colliding into each other by stepping in before they get too close and moving them apart if needs be. So let's say we have some sort of aircraft that's flying along. Now TCAS uses Mode S, which you may know about. This is an air traffic control technology that allows air traffic control on the ground to interrogate the intruder in this case, and the intruder will respond with some information. So this is continuously happening and in the process of an aircraft responding, obviously other aircraft nearby can see that response. And the in this case, the own ship can actually use that information to estimate, roughly speaking, where the intruders or the nearby aircraft might be. This is presented in the cockpit to the pilots. And you can see an example on the right hand side here. This is what it might look like in an Airbus with um, the, you know, the red dot there being a much higher uh, risk of collision all the way through to the, the kind of no threat right at the top there. And obviously some other information is presented such as altitude difference and whether that aircraft is climbing or descending. So let's say these aircraft continue to fly towards each other. At some point, just passively listening isn't enough and we move into a phase called active surveillance. Now at this point, the uh, ownership in this case is directly interrogating the intruder as if it's air traffic control. And if the system is thinking that these aircraft are starting to be too close, something called a traffic advisory will be issued. And this in the cockpit is basically just a, an annunciation of traffic traffic. And um, it, the, the pilots will then have to kind of get hands on controls and be ready in case there are further instructions they need to follow. So if the aircraft continue to get closer, even after a traffic alert, it looks like at this point they're going to end up with something called a resolution advisory. And this involves the aircraft actually doing something to move them apart from each other. So they'll use a form of mode S called coordination messages to communicate what they're planning to do. And this helps maximize the separation. And once that's been decided, the RAs will be announced in the cockpit. And these are compulsory instructions and they must be followed usually within about five seconds. So let's say in this case, the intruder has to climb and the ownership has to descend. Now, importantly, TCAS sort of depends on the fact that these aircraft are cooperative and actually don't want to crash into each other. Um, and so that's something to bear in mind for the, the, the attack. And the attack is really quite simple, at least at a high level. So mode S has been shown to be insecure and vulnerable to injection by uh, what by Costin and Schaefer and uh, many others as well over the years. So if we have some aircraft that's flying along and is issuing a mode S interrogation, we have an attacker who is injecting mode S responses to create a sort of false intruder. And this false intruder will appear to be flying towards the, um, the target aircraft which will eventually cause a TA and then an RA and require avoiding action. 
So in our simulator scenario, we saw this happen multiple times, and it, the aim was to see sort of how many resolution advisories pilots would fly. And we found, generally speaking, that um, pilots actually, after a handful of these ad resolution advisories, started to think something was up and something weird was going on. So we found that 26 of our pilots ended up turning the sensitivity of TCAS down, so it only issued traffic advisories. And a further an 11 of those actually turned the system to standby. So at that point, they received no TCAS announcements at all. And this typically happened, the first stage was after about four to five RAs, and the further switch down to standby was after another two to three. So it took a little while, but eventually it got there. So the important thing to remember here is that switching to standby actually causes the loss of TCAS. And it means that you then shift the burden of keeping your aircraft away from others onto air traffic control. And this was often done because the pilots felt they had no choice but to do it. There was something going on with TCAS. But... This then means that air traffic control have to keep you further apart from other aircraft. They also have an extra bit of workload on their part in making sure that you're always further away. On top of that, there was also excess fuel burn by following RAs. You don't really have a choice in that, but you have to do these maneuvers um, and that really does use some of your fuel. We found that most of the pilots continued on the route, but some of them felt that they needed to make extra maneuvers, so maybe to climb above clouds or to get out of cloud in some way or other so they could see whether there was an intruder nearby, or in some cases actually go back to the departure airport. And this was just because they felt like they couldn't really fly with um, TCAS in an in operative state. So generally speaking, this suggests that attackers can push pilots to fly these unnecessary RAs or reduce TCAS sensitivity. And if we look at some of the participant responses in a bit more detail, we found that many participants noted that RAs were actually really rare. And so this many RAs in close succession suggests something weird was going on. On top of that, one pilot who had had 17 years of flying experience had only had 10 RAs in his career or less than 10 RAs even and so it really gives you an idea of how rare these really are. Something that the participants told us was that weather would make attack identification much harder because you can't just look out the window and see whether anything's flying towards you and they also suggested that these sudden repeated RAs might actually affect other aircraft as well. So 28 of our participants felt that this attack lowered the safety of the aircraft because of this, but also because of things like it, it moving the passengers about on board. And finally, for this attack, pilots were reduced to uh, had to reduce sensitivity of the key safety system because of this, this, this distraction. One participant put this really well. Uh, they said that it was a sort of crying wolf effect where, you know, they're trained to listen to this system, do what it tells them to do, and that it's a really important safety system, but they had to doubt that system and it might impact how they respond to TCAS in the future. So the next system I'll talk about is the instrument landing system. Again, there's going to be some much more detailed talks on how this works and some uh, technical discussion of attacks on, on the system. But uh, for, for this, we're just going to talk about the glide slope. So the idea here is that in, the instrument landing system provides a method to do precision approaches that can be done in a wide range of weather conditions and it's really useful for busy airspaces where you need to land a lot of aircraft very accurately for example. So generally speaking the aircraft will follow a glide path down to the touchdown zone on the runway, the autopilot will help in following this glide path and the way it does this is there are two lobes, two signal lobes. One of them is modulated at 150 hertz and one is modulated at 90 hertz. And the aircraft will measure the relative signal strength of these two lobes and when the signal strength is equal it is on the correct glide path. The glide path itself will depend a little bit on the airport and the approach where usually it's about three degrees. So the attack is fairly simple because this system is fairly simple. There's no security in place. So we have this idea that an attacker transmits a false glide slope from the other side of the, the far end of the runway, maybe you know off to the side in, in some private land rather than actually on the airport. And they don't introduce a huge difference. You know, it's 350 feet, 100 meters, uh, but that's big enough to meet, really make a huge difference in where the aircraft would touch down if it followed it. 
And the concept is that the aircraft will intercept either from above or they, the attacker might be able to overpower the real glide slope and um, this will cause them to follow the false glide slope all the way to the ground. So as I mentioned, uh, it's very similar to Harshad's um, attack on on the localizer. So I really encourage you to check that talk out for much more technical detail. And the kind of overall idea of this attack is to get the the aircraft to overshoot the runway and abort the approach or land deep. Generally speaking, we found that uh, participants had to abort their approach. So they would arrive at the final stability check around the 1000 feet in altitude mark and they would realize that they were really on the wrong glide slope and had to have another go. However, in the following attempts, participants really avoided the glide slope. They used a wide range of different approach methods, some just for, still using some ILS tools, but not glide slope like lock DME, some using RNAV, and some using a visual approach. Generally speaking, the decision to go around was made about, as I mentioned, the kind of thousand feet mark, about one mile to go, so just over a minute before landing. So this seems quite late, but it's fairly safe and kind of well within um, the, the normal kind of checks, if you will. But some pilots did choose to land anyway. When they did, they really had to make a very steep correction. It was often at the limit of the kind of correction they could make, so it wouldn't always be possible. It really would depend on the conditions on the day. So again, this suggests that, you know, it, attackers can push pilots to miss an approach in this case and even abandon using the glide slope completely. And if we go back to the participant comments on this, they all identified an issue, but they very quickly lost confidence in the glide slope. So it re this attack really wouldn't work beyond one approach and it might not work for multiple aircraft because they would realize something weird was going on very quickly. They also commented that it was really a lot harder to manage this in low fuel situations. If you only have the fuel to do a one more approach and a diversion, you've got a, a lot of stress and a lot of workload to try and figure out what's going on and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Something that we didn't really think about when we were devising this attack is how they might detect something was going on. And one of the key factors in this was actually the precision path approach indicators or the PAPIs. So these are some lights to the side of the runway. And if you have two red and two white lights, you're on the correct light slope. And pilots used this, they, they said that it was important, they could see very quickly that they were off the glide slope. But they did note that in poor weather, this would be a bit harder to spot because you obviously have the pappies, but you might not be able to see the ground very well. And so you would lose that visual reference. Also experience with glide slope behaving weirdly helps and hinders. Pilots commented that glide slopes can bend a little bit sometimes, they can behave in weird ways. But that also kind of held them back because it meant that they they sort of allowed the deviation to, to run for a little while. They weren't sure if it was just a quirk of the glide slope. Also, the, the wide range of secondary approach methods really suggested uncertainty. There wasn't one clear way of how to actually handle this attack, which is a problem in trying to advise pilots in how to manage this kind of thing. There was also some concern about this short glide slope, so the, the die-hard approach, if you will, um, where the the glide slope would actually be shifted short of the threshold and if followed would lead the aircraft to land not on the runway at all. Um, that's not something we chose to look at in this case for, for reasons we discussed earlier, earlier, but it is a really interesting variant of this attack. So what did we find overall? Well, we saw that if attacks can cause spurious alarms, then the system often will just be turned off or ignored. And this sort of means that attackers are effectively forcing pilots away from systems by attacking them. On top of that, attacks have real potential for the disruption, though it's not always easy to see how that disruption will pan out. Uh, it can be quite hard to predict. So this also means in a way that it can have a wider, more unpredictable system impact. Participants were very quick to identify unusual behavior, and this was really encouraging to see. Uh, that procedure really helped carry them through and get them to a point where they could figure out something wasn't quite working properly and they could act on it. And on top of that, the attack success partly depends on wider system effects. So we touched on this a little bit, but things like traffic, weather, 
how busy air traffic control are, how many legs the pilot has flown that day really has a big impact on whether some of the more obvious attacks might fly under the radar or not. So where do we go from here? Well, we've shown that ILS and TCAS both have attacks that, ha that can have an impact on how the aircraft is flown. And these really do have a, dis a, a disruptive effect. You know, they, they aren't just a bit of an annoyance. They cause the aircraft to do something that it really wouldn't normally do. Larger impacts, though, it really remains to be seen how likely they are, whether it's possible to cause them, whether, you know, under some sort of very specific circumstances, this could work. Our view at the moment is it's very hard to predict what the larger impact might be, and it would be very hard to cause any sort of collision risk or multi-aircraft effect, just because of the numerous kind of circumstantial bits that would need to be pieced together for that to happen. The encouraging thing from this, though, is that existing procedure really is an ideal starting point for how to handle these attacks. So we're not starting from scratch. Regulators are already talking about how to incorporate awareness training. Um, and the pilots did really well already. Uh, already. So there's something really encouraging to build on that. If you find this talk interesting and you'd like to learn more, we had a full paper on this published earlier this year at NDSS 2020. We also have another attack in there on the ground proximity warning system and a lot more detail on all sorts of different responses. So do check that out. The link is just there on the slide. And thanks for listening. I'd be really happy to answer any questions in the chat.